So the first time I was introduced to porn, I was 28 years of age. You know, by this time, I'd been traveling full-time every weekend for two years. And it just wore me out, almost lost feeling even in my soul anymore. And I remember just walking into a hotel room and doing what I would always do. I'd grab the remote, I'd flip channels, and I saw this box on top of the television. And I knew what it was. I mean, I'd seen it in a hundred hotel rooms and I knew it was an adult movie box. So I just got up, hit the red button, started watching all of this pornography. The worst decision that I made that night was, was not hitting the red button. The worst decision was the next decision because I got up, went down to the front desk and I caught the attention of the clerk and I paid for the movie. And the reason I paid for the movie was because I knew that there was a church that was paying for my hotel room and I didn't want them to see that on the bill. It was the beginning of 23 years of covering up red buttons in my life. Bet on a craps table. A drunkard used it to buy some whiskey. There was nothing wrong with the silver dollar, but how it was used uh, in some cases was wrong. And that's the way it is with your body. Your body's a gift of God. It's pure, it's clean, but when you misuse it through the misuse of sex, it becomes destroyed. God wants us to keep our sex lives pure and clean within the confines of marriage. So I encourage you to remember this. God has not changed his moral standards for this generation. Be a man of God, be a woman of God, save yourself for your marriage partner. You'll be glad you did. I had one mission in life. All I wanted to do was preach the gospel. It just so impacted me. Like I remember meeting Pastor Willie George and uh, for whatever reason, I still don't know why today, because I'm a Canadian, he's a Texan. He liked me and he kind of took me under his wing and he said, Blaine, we're doing kids ministry. You're doing student ministry. Let's help to develop a student ministry. So we started doing this show called Fire by Night. And it was back in the 80s. It was just like this low budget Saturday Night Live that preached the gospel. Hey, I'm Blaine Bartell. Welcome to Fire by Night. It's good to have you with us on the program this month. We're going to be talking on the program about sex, dating, and relationships. And we're, hey, come on, you guys. <laughs> this is not the end of the program, okay? Save those for the end. It just exploded. Literally from about age 26 to 28, I went from being literally a nobody in America to being asked to speak in churches and conferences and festivals. And so ministry in those couple years began to change for me on some level. There was this celebrity aspect. I mean, when you combine television and speaking in front of audiences of thousands, and it had gone from preaching the gospel just out of the pure joy of it and seeing people come to Christ to slowly seeing, wait a minute, you know, this ministry stuff affords me popularity. It makes my ego feel good. There's big checks, and in the 80s, there was this youth ministry theme, it's better to burn out than rust out. Man, do whatever it takes, be radical, be, be committed. You know, on some level, that ministry would eventually become a drug in my life. I would actually live in that secret world for 23 years. I did not tell a soul. Really, the final five years, I knew that there was no way I was ever gonna win. The house of cards is gonna fall or I'm gonna die. Over the next several years of my life, I began to be two different people. And as long as I came back to, to my, my real world, my family world, and, and the two didn't intersect, I could kind of live with it, feigning myself as a, uh, a single man on a dating sites. I mean, I was doing really, really stupid things. I had made contact, you know, with this, this person, this woman. We go back to her place. Well, long story short, she comes from the back room and she looks at me with this grave anger in her tone, in her face, and she says, I know who you are. And she said, you are either gonna confess to your family, to your church, or I'm going to the Dallas Morning News tomorrow. I knew, I knew, I knew my life was over. I mean, I just, I knew I'd come to the end of myself. I knew I'd finally, finally destroyed my life. And I knew I was about to destroy my family. I didn't realize 
how much my sin was going to destroy the people that I loved the most. I'd always thought, well, it's going to destroy me one day. I guess I didn't see the ripple effect. Our church in Dallas, the, the people who were so broken, like you, you, you had all this vision and you were this man and, and the man of God and leading us and now we find out this is who you were and to see their brokenness and their anger and their hurt and their pain. I, I was so distraught. I went and wrote a, a suicide note, left it at my church, walked out into really busy traffic. And by God's grace, literally within 60 seconds, there were six police cruisers that surrounded me, put me in handcuffs, took me away. The next day I was flying to Phoenix, Arizona, and I was in rehab for 30 days. I mean, I just pour myself into this idea that I've got to recover, I've got to recover, I've got to recover. But at the end of the day, none of that seemed to be working fully. My heart had not changed. By that point, I'd lost my marriage, my boys. I was financially devastated, hanging on by a thread at that point. I remember driving from Kansas City to Tulsa. Not really praying, not listening to radio, just as pure quiet. And I heard what I know to be now, the voice of the Holy Spirit at the time I wasn't sure. And I heard this voice say, Blaine, I am not going to give you a recovery. I'm calling you into resurrection. And I had no idea what that meant, but I couldn't stop thinking about it. So I get home and I said, God, you're gonna have to show me what this means. And, and I open up to the story of Lazarus in John 11 and he wanted to communicate to me about what it means to resurrect my life out of sin. Because he said, Blaine, there's nothing to go back to. There is nothing to recover. Really about the next year after I heard that, Jesus just began to take me on this heart journey towards a resurrected life, a new imagination of who I am, who Blaine Bartell is, uh, who Jesus is really, and what he could do in my life. And no lie, absolute truth. In that next year, completely set free. And I don't mean like willpower, man, I finally got, no. Heart radically changed, new life, new way of thinking. And I say this with utter humility, by God's grace, and God's good community I have not had a relapse, have not had a slip up in that world in, in over 10 years now. Because resurrection really only has one limitation. There, there is no resurrection without death. I didn't want death of my ego. I didn't want death of my chasing after vanity and money and stuff. I had to be willing to put to death the old Blaine Bartell that the Blaine that wanted celebrity, the Blaine that wanted money, the Blaine that had all this pride about who he was. You know, Jesus said, if you want your life, if you really want to find it, you have to lose it. It wasn't about, oh, give me resurrection so I can get back to where I was. It was like, Lord, I'm gonna keep bearing this cross. I'm gonna keep living for others. I'm gonna keep living in simplicity and not be chasing all the things of this world because I wanna keep experiencing the joy of your resurrection in my life.